Buongiorno a tutti, mi scuso per la voce, quindi sarò molto breve. So, we are very honored today to have with us uh, Professor David Carré from ESPI and Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. David got his uh, PhD from Collège de France. Afterwards, he remained at Collège de France uh, as a head of a laboratory and because, of course, of the great uh, PhD de Gênes, was uh, very happy to have uh, some experimental activity going on also at Collège de France. And uh, David was in charge of the experimental activity. At the same time, he got a position at Ecole Polytechnique, where he is now professor. At the, and at the same time, he got uh, for a three years, a three year position from uh, the University of Beijing, Tsinghuan University. So he's also teaching at the University of China. As I used to see, he's a quite a distinguished scientist. And he also wrote, uh, together with uh, Pierre de Gen, this uh, famous book, uh, which has now become uh, the textbook of reference. Uh, it, has, it has been published uh, when, uh, 20 years ago, but it's now a classic textbook. It's a wonderful book. And I really, if you are interested in this, uh, it's, uh, it's quite nice to read it. Then. Uh, Today is an expert, a worldwide expert in soft matter physics, particularly in super hydrophobicity, and we are looking forward to a beautiful talk. Thank you very much. So, uh, I am particularly happy to be here. Uh, I, thank you for coming. Uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be in this uh, holy place of uh, science and uh, culture at large. And uh, more personally, I would say that uh, uh, after one year uh, without being in Italy, I feel quite bad. And last time was one year ago, so I feel good again. <coughs> so uh, the topic today is about what I call the shapes of water. <coughs> and it turns out that uh, often we think that water has no proper shape. But sometimes it takes very, very well-defined shapes. When I say very well-defined, I mean even in a mathematical sense, you can feel that these shapes are uh, very regular. And you see here the coexistence of something which is called an undulodial shape and a sphere. Uh, it's a real experiment. It looks a little bit like a computer experiment. It's something you can do by opening gently a tap and the only trick is that water is a bit special. You add a little bit of polymer, which avoids uh, that this water breaks too early, so that you see both shapes, and again, very well-defined shapes, and things which are indeed a bit unexpected, such as water rising up, instead of being subjected to gravity, as it is most often. So what I would like to do is a kind of history of the shape of water, uh, the fact that it led scientists to build a field which is the sur uh, surface uh, uh, science, soft surface science. And then I would like to somehow exploit the manipulation of shapes to show you uh, recent uh, advances in different uh, subfields. So it's true that generally uh, water has no proper shape. And this is a good example, a beautiful series of photographs by uh, the Japanese photographer Sujimoto. Uh, he's interested in photographing the sea, as you can see. And uh, it's uh, strictly horizontal, obviously. It's strictly horizontal because at the large scale of a sea, uh, water is subjected to gravity. And so very naturally, because it is fluid, it adopts the shape of the container, uh, which is the bottom of the sea. So we are used to that. We are used to see water as something with no proper shape and where horizontality dominates everything. And we use that, actually, uh, very often to build uh, something uh, uh, as an horizontal line. We use water. We use bubble in water. We use this kind of system. Uh, so we can say, and if we start really from the beginning of this science, uh, maybe one of the early texts might be the text by Pliny the Elder in 77, so quite long ago. And uh, for Pliny, one is surprised, yeah, indeed, because we are used to flat water, 
that water spontaneously adopts the shape of a sphere. However, there is nothing more obvious in nature. This is true. If we look carefully, we see many, many, uh, many uh, situations where we have this uh, shaped water. Everywhere, hanging drops round out it in small spheres when thrown on dust. This is remarkably precise. Deposited on the downy surface of leaves. Not all the leaves, downy surface. In another translation, it's woolly surface. You have to, to have something on the leaf. They show, the drops, a perfect sphericity. So when Pliny observed that, he could not realize something very important, which is that looking at the millimetric scale of drops and uh, uh, observing the sphericity of the drops, he could have been led to the existence of molecules, uh, something which was understood nearly 2,000 years later. In between, we have many interesting situations where people realize gradually that surfaces are special. Special, I mean, compared to volume. And the first name, maybe to be quoted there, uh, it's a very natural name, I think, in this city, is Galileo. Galileo, uh, as we all know, was interested in the, the way um, massive things are falling. And he looked at that in air, but also in water. And he looked at that with little copper plates. And he had the nice idea, which is very natural when you want to look at the fall, to put these copper plates at the surface of water first and to see how they fall. And he had a surprise, which is that while these copper plates, of course, were falling inside water, when they were placed at the surface, and this is a top view of water, and at the bottom of the container there is a grid, so that you can see the deformations of the surface of water, when he deposited these centimetric scale copper plates, which are quite thin, they were floating. They were floating provided they deformed the surface, and so this is, uh, of course, something he noticed. And if you push on them with your finger, of course, once they are immersed, they fall gently. An experiment that Galileo did not do, which is very interesting, is to place now several copper plates. And if you do that, you notice that there is a long-range attraction between them. Maybe you, you think that I, I cheated a little bit. I threw the second plate to the first one. So I put a third one. Now they are quite, quite far from each other. And when this deformation overlaps with this one, then there is this irresistible attraction between them, between them and they somehow self-organize. So this is a, a double experiment, which indeed says that a surface has special property that you would not have uh, inside uh, the volume. But at the time of Galileo, uh, no theoretician for understanding uh, Pliny's observation and this remarkable fact. So, one century after that, we are now in Cambridge. It's a tour of Europe. Uh, we started very logically by Italy. And in Cambridge, we find Newton. And close to Newton, we find uh, Brooke Taylor, the man who invented something which is so useful to all of us, which is uh, Taylor's expansions. He was a mathematician, but he did a very, very nice experiment which I think uh, must be quoted in a talk about the shapes of water. Uh, what Taylor did was to take two glass plates close to each other, and they make a wedge. So seen from the top, it is something like that, with an angle which can be 10 to 10 to 10, 5 to 10 degrees, and this angle is there. And you take this device, and you contact a bath of liquid, oil in this case, and when you do this experiment, when Taylor did this experiment, he saw something which was completely amazing for him, which was a mathematical object forming in front of him. It was so surprising to him that in the little paper he wrote, he said, I am an amateur in physics. I am a mathematician. I'm sorry. So probably it is a dream of a mathematician that I see a hyperbola. So this is a hyperbola. And uh, the paper after Taylor's paper is a paper from a genuine experimentalist who looked carefully at all the, the data that you can extract from such a curve, and he concludes that you have a very nice hyperbola. This is one very beautiful result because you capture many things in one experiment. Uh, in particular, you capture the fact that this rise, which is 
associated with a shape, very similar to what you saw in the first uh, movie, uh, stops for some confinement. When it's not confined enough, seen from the top when the distance between the two plates is too large, then there is nothing special. The water recovers its horizontality. So here we have a new information, which is very uh, useful, of course, which is the scale below which you have special shapes and uh, counterintuitive phenomena, such as rise of something which is dense. And this scale, the distance here between the two plates, is a few millimeters. So uh, it is uh, uh, something which, of course, allows you to see directly with your naked eyes the phenomena that I'm discussing, but it covers many orders of magnitude uh, between uh, these uh, few millimeters and, let's say, uh, uh, the nanometer, which would be the scale of a molecule. Um, fourth observation. Uh, now we go to Germany and we meet Dr. Leidenfrost, a physician from Duisburg. And Leidenfrost did a remarkable experiment which he described very accurately, which consisted of having a hot plate, very hot, typical temperature is 300 degrees, and he deposited on this plate either alcohol or water. And when you do that, here it's done with water, you observe something which is not observed generally with water. Water is extremely mobile. It's so mobile that all the little in the initial velocity that you have is conserved, basically, uh, until the end of the plate. And when you look at individual drops, they look uh, very spherical again. So it could have been an example by Pliny, uh, a downy uh, surface of leaves thrown on dust or deposited on a hot plate. Uh, they are very spherical. Leidenfrost understood the reason of this phenomenon that you probably know. Uh, it's called the Leidenfrost phenomenon in, uh, in, in English. In, in French, it's called calefaction, made by heat. Uh, the, the plate is so hot that this liquid never contacts the substrate. Instead, there is a little cushion of vapor which comes between the liquid and, and the uh, substrate so that these drops are little hovercrafts and so they are levitating. And because they are levitating, they are amazingly mobile. And also, which was something very curious to notice by Leiden Frost, they do not boil. They do not boil because for boiling, you need nucleation points, and so you need a contact. And so this absence of, of boiling, uh, this high mobility, all of that is related to this little film of vapor. I'll come back to that later. So we have different observations. All are related to the existence or to the influence of surfaces. And we had to wait 50 more years to find the solution of all of that. And the solution is captured by a very, very simple formula. You have a liquid there. The liquid is made of molecules. These molecules are condensed. And so this means that a molecule which is at the surface carries a little bit of energy compared to a molecule which is inside the volume because uh, it misses neighbors. It, ha it has typically half the neighbors that the molecule uh, has inside the volume. So this means, as a consequence, that there is a special energy which is attached to the surface. And this special energy, def by definition, which is positive, uh, is proportional to the number of molecules at the surface that is to the surface area of your surface. And the constant of proportionality uh, depends on the cohesion of the fluid. If the fluid is extremely cohesive, it's more costly to place a molecule at the surface. If it is less cohesive, it's less costly. And this is expressed just by this quantity gamma, which is called uh, the surface tension. And if you take this simple formula, uh, you can explain what I said earlier, all of that, in particular, of course, the sphericity of drops once gravity is negligible. If gravity is negligible, then the energy of the drop is dominated by its surface energy. And the minimum of the surface energy is given by a shape which minimizes the surface area. So the sphere is a very natural thing. But you can also explain this hyperbolic shape by Brooke Taylor and all the previous experiments and all the experiments which are coming after in this talk. For example, this was a very important point scientifically, but it was also a very important point philosophically, 
because uh, in uh, 1805, suddenly, it was clear that observing a drop and understanding why it was spherical uh, allowed you to propose that matter was made of molecules, and that these molecules were interacting, and so on. And of course, we all know that it took one more century to establish that firmly with, uh, with Einstein. But people immediately caught this idea and thought uh, that it was uh, really possibly a great advance. And in particular, Goethe in Germany, we are back to Germany, Goethe uh, immediately took these new ideas and put it at the beginning of his very famous novel, The Elective Affinities, elective affinities between people, but uh, at the beginning of the, of the book, elective affinities between molecules. And he concludes a paragraph which really summarizes what I said from Young and Laplace. We can be really impressed by, the, by the, uh, 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 how fast he caught these new ideas. We can be impressed because the Young paper is very difficult to read, and Laplace paper is also very difficult to read for a very different reason. One is purely philosophical. The second one is purely mathematical. They say the same thing at the end, and Goethe apparently uh, caught that. And at the end of the chapter, or the paragraph where he summarizes all these new ideas, he concludes with something which is very surprising and that I would like to call for a moment the Goethe's theorem. He says, a falling raindrop is round. So I, of course I stress the word falling because he, he adds something which is not trivial, which is the idea that uh, if you add some force, and in particular if the drop is falling, you have a friction force which is due to the ambient air which is around. If you add a force, the drop, the raindrop, can remain spherical. So, I first assume that this is true. Uh, it's very difficult to understand how Goethe produced this idea because it's something which is difficult to observe in uh, 1807. It's difficult to observe because uh, the typical size of a raindrop is one millimeter. The typical speed of a raindrop is 20 kilometers per hour. And so next time it's, it's raining, apparently Saturday here, uh, try to do that, you know, uh, I never succeeded, uh, despite the fact that I come from a rainy uh, city. So, uh, I suppose that this is true, and what I uh, sketch is a typical rain. A typical rain consists of many drops, of course, and of polydispersed uh, distribution. You have tiny drops, they must be large enough to fall, so typically above 100 micrometers, and uh, they cannot be so large. This is an observation. Drops, raindrops on the Earth have a maximum size, which is three millimeters. Why not? Uh, we never heard of a raindrop that big, but we heard of hailstones. And hailstones can be three centimeters, which is, well, uh, 10 times larger, which means, of course, 1,000 times heavier, and it also means that it's quicker by a factor which is typically three. So kinetic energy of a hailstone can be 10,000 times the kinetic energy of, 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 a, of a drop, of a raindrop, and suddenly we understand that this innocent uh, inequality is something which makes, which makes our life much, much easier. Something made of water coming from the sky could be, can be, but raindrops could be much, much larger, in which case uh, rain, could be a disaster for all of us. It could kill us, okay? The fact that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, we have so many damage with hailstone is not related to the fact that they are solid, it's related to the fact that they are big and quick. So, what I would like to show you, relatively qualitatively, but with some quantitative, uh, I hope, uh, uh, statement, is the fact that this theorem and this inequality are related to each other. So, let's start by an experiment. So, a physicist train. So, you simplify the reality, but not too much. Simplifying is to make four drops for the rain, but not too much is to keep the polydispersity. So, first, we are going to see small raindrops, and, uh, well, they are flowing continuously, and then larger one, and I stop the movie, and it's extremely clear that whatever the size and this bar is five millimeters, whatever the size, they are indeed spherical, so Goethe is, is, is correct, and of course the velocity 
depends on, on uh, the, the velocity depends on the size, but not the shape. So why is it like that? Uh, well, with our simple formula that I wrote earlier, we can understand this fact. The velocity of a raindrop is fixed by the balance between the weight, which is sensitive to the density, to g, and to the volume of the drop, which itself is sensitive to the cube of the size, and uh, it is balanced by the friction of the air. And this could be a very difficult formula to write because we don't know the shape a priori, and also we don't know the function of the velocity this friction is. Of course, if we read a little bit of a textbook in uh, hydrodynamics, we guess that it should be an inertial friction sensitive to the square of the velocity, but because we don't know the shape and because the friction should be sensitive to the shape, I just keep this general uh, uh, equation without uh, making explicit this velocity, but if I am able to express this quantity, of course, I am able to tell you what is this velocity. I am not interested exactly in that because I want to see why and uh, how drops could be uh, or should be spherical. And they should be spherical if the force which makes them spherical, which derives from the energy that I wrote earlier, remember, surface tension times surface area, I derive I get surface tension times the size. This is a force which tends to make a drop spherical. And if this force is larger than the friction, which of course could be the cause of deformation, then the drop should be spherical. And here, there is a kind of miracle. The friction, I know it. I know it. It is a weight. And so you immediately see that the condition of sphericity is that the drop has been smaller than some length, which depends on surface tension and density. You calculate this length, and you find 3 millimeters. So if drops are smaller than 3 millimeters, they should be spherical. And all the drops are smaller than 3 millimeters. So Goethe is always correct. He's correct for the very uh, thin rain in, in Brittany, let's say. He's also correct for the very heavy rain in Congo. What's happening if, by accident, a very big drop forms in the sky? So a drop which would be above this limit. This is an experiment that you can do. So you climb to a very high building. You make very big drops, a very nice way to do that. Kids love this experiment. You take a balloon, you fill this balloon with, with water, and you pinch the balloon. And so then you make a globule uh, of size, which is uh, arbitrarily large. Uh, and you look at the fall. And after very typically 10 meters of fall, you see very interesting events. So you see a collection of drops, of course. You see, for the very big ones, you see a very interesting deformation. The drops adopt the shape of a hamburger, which is the contrary of what kids think. Generally, they think that drops are elongated. It's exactly the contrary, but if you think of that, it's extremely logical. You are the drop, you are falling, so for you, air is coming, and so air is flattening your body. And so very logically, the front is flattened, while the rear is, uh, is uh, uh, more spherical. So this is the first mode of deformation. But there is one which is much more spectacular, which takes place when the drops are even bigger. And you are going to see some of these instabilities. So this is the first one. This is the second one. Uh, this is really a very beautiful object. A uh, third one will come uh, quite soon. I'm sorry for the discontinuity of the movie, which is uh, not, of course, in reality. And you will have a new one. Here it is. And so I stop the movie. And so what's happening there? It takes this back shape. And these back shapes come from the fact that air is pressing on your body. But surface tension is so low, because it's so, the, the, the drop is so big, that air can even penetrate. And then it explodes. And it explodes because air divides around you. And because it divides, it accelerates. It's something that we all know on highways. You know, the, the people uh, uh, who are doing moto have the jackets which are inflated. So it's exactly that. The jacket is inflated by the acceleration of the wind, the Bernoulli effect. And so it's bigger. And if it's bigger, air is more divided. And so this is a catastrophic sequence where uh, you explode in a few milliseconds. And so if by accident, a difference was, of course, uh, the, the people uh, on a bike being the fact that the jacket is, of course, uh, on the body. Here, the jacket is free to inflate, and so there is no limit. Uh, people today think that these, these events exist in, in the sky. 
because the coalescence of drops can produce very big hailstones, and similarly, they, it could produce very big drops, but these very big drops are soft, which is not the case of hailstone, and as a consequence, they decay in smaller drops, which explains why, at the end, you find the drops which can resist by surface tension to uh, friction. And so this limit of three millimeters. So then the drop is coming to the earth. Generally, it finds water. When a drop finds water, you have amazing sequences, such as this one, coalescence produces a daughter drop. But the daughter drop it says itself, when it coalesces, produces a third generation. And the third generation will produce a fourth generation. And finally, in this case, you have a very, very tiny little drop. Uh, and all this sequence, which is called the cascade of coalescence, was uh, relatively well explained uh, by a team in Chicago uh, two years ago. So this is very spectacular. It's much less spectacular when this drop is contacting a solid, so here a piece of plastic, then you observe something which is extremely common, which is a little lens of liquid on your solid. What I would like to stress is the existence of a line. This is a line seen from the top it's, of course, a circular line. It's called the contact line. And this contact line is responsible for many effects we observe in daily life. Uh, the first one is adhesion of drops. Uh, we said that at a small scale, and this scale, we understood that it was always the same. It was these three millimeters we calculated. Uh, below this scale, so the scale of all the raindrops, of course, uh, then uh, gravity does not really matter. And so uh, capillarity dominates everything. And as a consequence, when you tilt the plate, drops can stick. It's water. It's very fluid. It should flow, of course. Uh, at the scale of a river, it flows very easily. But at the scale of a drop, a raindrop can be stuck on a window pane, even when it is vertical. And of course, a windshield, which is also inclined, similarly trap drops. So there is adhesion related to the contact line. And there is also friction, something we discussed this morning in a course uh, that I give with a great pleasure here, the fact that when these lines are pushed, when they are forced to move, there is something special close to the line. Uh, there is a, a singularity in the dissipation. And this has an enormous dissipation compared to what you could expect naively. And so friction, adhesion are generated by contact lines. And so because, on the, on the other hand, we have this natural tendency uh, of drops to remain spherical, I would like to discuss the possibility of keeping spherical a drop on a solid to avoid all these uh, complicated facts and to uh, uh, recover the natural mobility that we know for water. So we look around, or we open the natural history by Pliny, and we understand that if we find a plant which is woolly, which is downy, uh, maybe drops should be much more spherical than here. So this is the case, the famous case of lotus leaf. A lotus leaf, when you deposit a drop on it, this drop uh, remains indeed very spherical, quasi-spherical. And when you look carefully at the surface of the leaf, you find little bumps. This is what uh, uh, Pliny called a uh, downy surface. He had really very good eyes, you see, because the scale which is there is 50 micrometers. So each of them is 10, 20 micrometers, which is really the limit where you can see uh, uh, something with your naked eye. This is something slightly larger and very funny. It is a texture that you find on the leaf of a magnolia. And two other, uh, 200 uh, other plants have similar uh, uh, repellency to, uh, toward water. Uh, what is the reason of this effect? Uh, it's related to the fact that if you look carefully, you see a superstructure on each bump, and these are crystals of wax. So you have a mixture between uh, chem che chemistry and physics. Uh, it's very good to have a mixture between uh, our departments, very generally. Nature has the same opinion. Uh, you have a naturally hydrophobic substrate, and when you make it rough, you make it much more hydrophobic. The reason being, I think, quite easy to understand, when drop is coming, it stays at the top of these structures, so that below these drops, below this one, below this one, uh, you have mostly air, 
and very little of contact, of genuine contact with the solid. Actually, you can see that it's silvery, and so it betrays the existence of an interface at the bottom of the drop. And so you are not so far from the light and force situation where you were levitating on a, on a film of air, or vapor in this case, and as a consequence, we saw that you make a wonderful uh, you, uh, mobility, uh, you create, you generate this amazing mobility. So this is a plant, but we could think also of animals. And uh, one of the most remarkable one is a water strider. Uh, if you look at the leg of the water strider, it is similarly uh, textured. When I say similarly, I mean there is also a texture, but of course this texture is extremely different from the one you saw on plants. And this is a very open question today, which is when you make a texture and you create a material which repels water, uh, what are the properties you can generate? And uh, when you design the texture, you have many possibilities. And so, uh, very naturally, you can think of many uh, uh, functions. Here, one of the functions, obviously, is to let this uh, creature above the surface of the pond. So for, for it, it's a question of life, of course. Uh, and it's clear that all the legs repel very efficiently water. If you do the Galileo experiment, where you press on the water strider with your finger, uh, it's a disaster, you, it sinks immediately. The density of the animal is larger than the density of water. So it's a very impressive life. He has really to rely on these uh, textures he has at the surface, and he has probably to uh, accept the idea that if the water becomes contaminated, uh, this is the end for, for it. So this is one case. There is one which, in my opinion, is even more impressive, which is the case of this spider, which is called Argironeta. Argironeta comes, of course, from the Greek argyros, uh, silver. And indeed, when this uh, uh, spider is underwater, it is covered, or to be more precise, its abdomen is covered by air. And uh, the reason, uh, or the reason why it is like this, is that you uh, expect this abdomen to be super hydrophobic, which exactly means super aerophilic. It prefers to be covered by air rather than by water. And as a consequence, this spider carries with it underwater a plastron of air, which is enough to walk, uh, to climb, to swim in a sense, but which is not enough to live. Uh, uh, this spider has a very unique characteristic, which is to live constantly underwater. And this is very different from other little insects, where from time to time they go inside water. They have such a plastron. It's enough to carry a little bit of oxygen. They stay very typically 20 minutes, and then they go out. Notonecta, for example, uh, does that. But this spider, for some unknown reason, chose to go underwater constantly, and it's a relatively big animal. Uh, it's, uh, it's even venomous, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not so pleasant to, to meet. But it's everywhere uh, on the Earth. So it means that it succeeded somehow to find solutions to its uh, strange life. If you look at the abdomen, it's covered by hairs. And if you look at each hair, it's itself hairy. So it's a remarkable structure. Why is it like that? Why is it so different from the previous textures I, I, I showed? Again, nobody knows. I said this plastron is not enough. And so the spider has to build a house of air inside water, in particular for eating. And to do that, it goes to the surface of the pond. So uh, uh, it, find, uh, it finds the atmosphere. And when it finds it, it turns itself upside down. It's going to do that now. And then. It does a movement. Ah, I had exactly the same problem this morning, so I'll show it again. If you are not too sensitive to these monsters, uh, you should accept this, uh, uh, this second uh, uh, movie. And so when it finds a surface, it, it, it changes its, its direction. And then there is something which is extremely quick. You can see that. And it seems that it carries something which is very large. And indeed, it is a case. When you look now underwater, you find a house under construction, it's here. Of course, it is, um, um, uh, uh, it is blocked by plants and also by a web that the spider makes. And the spider comes from above 
with this big brick of air, very large, much larger than a plastron, and it incorporates this brick to the house, and it goes again to the surface, and it does that typically 15 times until the house is large enough so that it can enter inside, and in particular, make the energetic activities uh, it, it has. Uh, think of this life. Uh, it's a very, it's a very uh, silly life. It's a kind of Sisyphus, if you want, but it's Sisyphus the other way, so it has to carry constantly something which is light underwater instead of pushing the rock at the top of the mountain. But exactly like Sisyphus, from time to time, a fish passes there, and of course the house uh, leaves the place, goes to the surface, this is so natural, and the poor spider has to rebuild a new house. So, for the spider, what is really critical is that it needs only a few numbers of trips to make that, and so the volume that it takes is a critical quantity. Uh, this is something that you can mimic uh, at the scale of the lab. You make this artificial spider made of a hydrophilic head and of a hydrophobic, super hydrophobic to be precise, and this is very important, uh, abdomen, and you cross an interface and you look at what you are doing. So here you couple a natural property which is super hydrophobicity plus dynamics. It's very sophisticated. And so if the velocity is modest, you have just the plastron of air. It's so thin that you cannot, you cannot see it with backlighting like this. If you cross at a larger velocity and above a very well-defined threshold in velocity, you find that uh, you succeed in a sense because you make a bubble uh, whose volume is comparable to the volume of the abdomen, which is exactly what it has to do to have a limited number of trips to build the house. And so you can be confident that the volume is an increasing function of the velocity, and why not try to make a house in just one shot, which you can do easily in a lab with this artificial spider. Indeed, you carry a very large quantity of air, but now it's so large that it's too light and Archimedes wins and you lose the bubble. So this means that the spider cleverly understood all of that because as you can guess, it has to do uh, a fast trap when it comes from the interface, but when it goes out of the bubble, of course it must be slow. It's Sisyphus, but not too much. It puts the big brick of air in the house, but then it goes slowly so that it is in this regime and never in this one. And so the spider indeed uh, found all these solutions. It found a way to, uh, to make his life relatively reasonable. Just to tell you why you have this threshold in velocity, if I stop the picture here, it's very clear that when you have, and this is a necessary condition, when you have a super hydrophobic bead, you make a hole in water. And so this pinches, of course, with time. It pinches either because of surface tension or because of gravity, depending on the, on the size of the body. The spider is just at the limit. And there is a typical time for that. And this time only depends on the size of the spider. And so you have this time. And at the same time, you have the time to cross the interface. And so you have to compare both of them. And you immediately understand that if you cross the interface in a time which is too, uh, too long, then the cavity has time to close and you do not untrain any significant quantity. And so with that, you can calculate the threshold in velocity above which you generate this interesting regime. So, um, all of that was about functions that you find in nature and which are related to uh, very hydrophobic materials. Now, I would like to go to something which is more dynamics, uh, we had a little bit of dynamics here, and which is the mobility that you generate. So, inclined plates, a lotus leaf, on which you uh, uh, sprinkled pepper to mimic a contaminant, a drop is coming, uh, it's extremely mobile, it does not stick, it's quick, and in addition, it takes with it the contaminants which are at the surface, so the so-called lotus effect, the fact that the rain very nicely cleans the surface when they have this property. Um, there is something which is, I, I think, even more surprising, 
which is the fact that even with a viscous liquid, it's still extremely mobile. So if you compare the typical velocity of these drops with usual drops, the factor is typically 1,000. So they are 1,000 quicker than what they are usually. And this remains true when the liquid is viscous. So here you are going to see something with a viscous liquid and where, in addition, you incline the plate significantly, so not a few degrees, but let's say 35 degrees, and the drop is coming, and you look at it when it reaches its regime of terminal velocity. Something which is extremely close to what I showed for a raindrop falling in the air. You remember, we asked the question of shape, and we asked the question of terminal velocity. So we do the same experiment here with a drop which is also spherical, but which is close to a solid, which it's, it does not wet at all. And so this might be very similar, and indeed, the final speed are very similar. However, there is a big difference. So the drop, uh, the, the plate is inclined, but the camera is tilted by the same angle, and the liquid will come from here. And when you do this experiment, you see that. Okay, I stop the movie. So you see a shape which is not at all the spherical shape we had initially. So the fact that you have a plate close to the liquid changes dramatically the shape. And you can be first surprised by this result, and so you you do again the experiment. Uh, we all know that reproducibility is something uh, we must have in science. And this is one case where a not reproducible experiment is more interesting than a reproducible one. Uh, when you do again this experiment, it happens that you see that. Okay? So these shapes are very well defined. This is uh, what we call usually a peanut, and this is what we call usually a donut. And then you open the books and you look at the history of this phenomena. And you discover something which is interesting and, in a sense, which brings us back to Galileo. Looking at objects in the sky and trying to understand the shapes of this object. And Newton, as you, as you know, said the following thing. Because the Earth is rotating, uh, well, centrifugation should matter. And a very good picture of that should be a fluid body. And so it should be squeezed at the, at the, at the poles and slightly inflated at the, at the equator. After Newton, uh, we find the name of Laplace. And Laplace said Newton has had this very interesting idea, but if it were rotating faster, then it should be more and more squeezed, more and more inflated, and very naturally we should generate a disk. And so people looked in the sky to see disk like this. Uh, and after Laplace came Rayleigh, so really a very impressive list of names. And Rayleigh said, well, centrifugation tried to expel matter out of the axis of rotation. And so the idea of a disk is, inter is interesting, but this disk might have a hole inside, and we might generate a wheel of liquid, a torus. And this is, uh, this is uh, Rayleigh's torus. Why? Because the big difference with a raindrop is that the solid is there. It, it has a very weak influence in terms of wettability, but it has a very strong influence in terms of movement. It generates rotation. And so these drops are fast and rotating, and as a, as a natural uh, consequence, the shape can change if uh, the action of rotation is larger than the action of surface tension, and uh, uh, rotation should be sensitive to the square of the velocity, so if you increase a lot of velocity, centrifugation becomes really, uh, can become a dominant effect, then you can modify the shape of these drops. So after, after Rayleigh, we find the name of Poincaré. So Poincaré was obsessed by this question. He wrote a whole book on that, 300 pages, which is called On the Shape of a Revolving Fluid Mass, something like that. And his idea was the following. He said when you make a, a drop revolve in air, you should split it in two parts. And so on the way of this splitting, you should define uh, what I call today a peanut shape. And so uh, then there was a kind of confusion because we, there was this idea by uh, Rayleigh, Laplace, and so on, the new idea by Poincaré, and Chandra Sekar came, and Chandra Sekar did a, a terrible calculation, 30 pages of calculation by Chandra Sekar is maybe 300 pages by a normal person. And so it's very difficult to follow. But at the end, you understand that uh, both shapes are natural shapes when you think of a rotating fluid object, indeed. But the peanut should be more stable. This is 
the final result by Chandra Sekhar. One very, very cheap argument for that is that a peanut is two drops which are close to each other, while a wheel of same volume has a much larger surface area. So if you just think of the surface area, obviously uh, the peanut is more favorable. So when you do the experiment in a lab using non-wetting system, you find actually both shapes, the Poincaré shape and the Rayleigh shape. So this is, uh, of course, a bit unexpected because one is supposed not to exist. And you can organize this kind of experiment where suddenly you leave the substrate. So now you go in the, in the, in the dark night. And so when you do that, and when a wheel is coming, when the donut is coming, you see that there is a very nice instability that we would like to call the Chandra Sekhar instability, which indeed transform the, uh, the, the donut in peanut, showing the uh, higher degree of stability of this uh, uh, second shape. So this is dynamics. Dynamics on an inclined plate. Again, I'm so happy to speak of inclined plate in, in, in Padova, the city of uh, Galileo. Uh, but you can also organize impacts. And impact on a regular solid produces either splashes or a disk of liquid. On a water repellent material, it's very different. It produces a sequence which looks similar at the very beginning when inertia dominates, but then when surface tension recovers its right, you generate very, very beautiful shapes and a recoiling of your liquid so that at the end, the drop is taking off and leaves the substrate absolutely uh, clean. Here, look at that. There is an emission of a little satellite and you are going to see the coalescence of the little one on the big one, and it produces again the cascade of coalescence we saw earlier. And we have the shock of these little drops of water and this big one. Look at this one, very hard shock. Look at this one, very soft shock. It's the same solid, it's the same, uh, it's the same uh, liquid, but uh, the pressure inside the liquid are different. This is the Laplace theorem. And so uh, the hardness uh, is related to the size in this particular case. If it's a real rain instead of one drop, then you have many, many events depending on the size, depending on the speed, but the result will be that after being exposed to uh, quite a heavy rain in this case, uh, the solid which was dry will uh, remain uh, completely dry. So uh, there are many things to say about that. Uh, and uh, for the students of my course, I'd be happy to go inside the details of that tomorrow morning. But uh, I would like to quote one recent advance on this topic, because the title of this talk is The Shapes of Water. And of course, you manipulate the shapes here. And in particular, as you can see, you transfer kinetic energy in surface energy. And so you can store your kinetic energy. And this is the reason why you can generate a bouncing event like this. And you can think even deeper on that slightly deeper, uh, just below the surface. Uh, you look at the dimension of surface tension, remember, uh, energy per unit area, which means force per unit length, and this is the unit of a stiffness of a spring. F is Kx, you know. Here, similarly, we have a spring. We know what is its stiffness. It is surface tension. And so people try to find other solutions to that, and I like very much this recent work by Zhuang Kai Wang from Hong Kong University, he designed a solid with very large structures. And so this is a very good trick to store energy, not necessarily on the lateral expansion, but by penetrating a little bit inside this solid. And this produces a very nice effect, which I, li I like a lot. The drop is coming. Uh, it will bounce, but, uh, sorry, it will bounce, but it will take off immediately without recoiling as a kind of UFO, if you want. So in this case, you reduce a lot the time spent by the drop close to the solid. And we could say that this is really the ultimate quest for repellency. Uh, well, it's true that this impacting drop spends a few milliseconds uh, against the substrate. But even this time, you can think of reducing it by this kind of trick. And this, if this is very cold and if this is regular water, you can avoid freezing, for example, during the contact. So um, I would like to finish by uh, going back to the beginning of the talk and by quoting 
uh, again, Leiden Frost. Um, another way to generate water repellency is to have a very hot solid. And you remember that in this case, the liquid is levitating on a cushion of vapor. And this cushion of vapor can be seen with the naked eye, and Leiden Frost saw it. You see, this is a drop, this is a reflection of the drop. Temperature here is 300 degrees, this is water and the thickness of the film is typically the thickness of a hair. And so using backlighting, it's extremely easy to see. Uh, it's interesting to know that Leiden Frost used backlighting. He put a candle behind, and he could see light passing between the substrate and the liquid. So what is the difference between this situation and the situation I described earlier? Well, for many things, no difference. It bounces, it slides very nicely, uh, all of that is, is quite comparable. There is one big difference, which is that this drop is evaporating. So it produces constantly vapor. It's evaporating very slowly, and Leiden Frost was very surprised of that. First, because it's not boiling. This is visible in this picture. But secondly, because this layer of vapor is a very good insulator. And so the time it takes for evaporating this millimetric drop is a few minutes. So it's extremely long uh, if you can trap it. But it produces vapor. And so the idea is to say, could we exploit this new fact? We have an object which is of very low friction, with no adhesion, and it produces something. Can we exploit this something? And this was done in a very, very beautiful experiment. I, I must say that I love this experiment, uh, by Heiner Linke a few years ago, uh, now, uh, something like nearly 10 years ago. He took a hot solid. He placed levitating drops on this hot solid. And he sees something which is what we saw up to now, plus a new thing, which is self-propulsion. These drops are moving to the right with a very well-defined velocity in a very well-defined direction. Uh, maybe you think that this is tilted. I show many examples where it is tilted. This is strictly horizontal. What is the trick? What is the source of asymmetry? If you have very good eyes, maybe you see that. There is a little asymmetric texture at the surface. And now I make a zoom on this experiment the surface is covered by, um, by teeth, like that, so that when the drop is levitating, it is self-propelled. If I ask you what is the direction of the movement, which is not obvious from this movie, I think it's not so obvious to guess. I hope so. Uh, we spend a few years on that. Uh, observation, of course, tells you the answer, but why is it this direction? This is not obvious. The direction is this one. It is the direction of the highest friction in a sense. So, uh, but of course, friction is not the propelling force, and so it could be that. And the real velocity, uh, real time velocity of this drop is 10 centimeters per second. So it is a very quick motion. So why is it like that? When, when you look carefully at this movie, and you can look very long because it's a loop film, you see, and so it, it, it's, it's traveling forever, uh, you see waves, you see oscillations, you even see a few bubbles, you see many things, and so you are tempted to build a scenario on all these events. And of course, because you know the answer, you succeed always. You find always a reason why it should go to the right, because of waves, because of oscillations, because of that, until you do an experiment. And this is a good advice for the young people who are there. Uh, it's very nice to think theoretically, but it's also, also very nice to do experiments from time to time. You save many years. And the experiment consists of having a levitating solid instead of a levitating liquid, which you can do with dry ice. Dry ice sublimates at room temperature, and so it can similarly uh, levitate. You place a piece of dry ice on a hatchet, which is a hot hatchet, so this levitates, and it moves exactly the same way, in the same direction, and so on. You can even deduce from the acceleration the force which is acting on this body. If, with your finger, you push the piece of dry ice in the wrong direction, it slows down now. It makes what I would like to call a U-turn, and it goes constantly in this direction. So this tells you that the movement has nothing to do with the liquid nature of the levitating body. It has to do with the fact that vapor goes below, and at the same time, this vapor is squeezed by the body, the dense body which is above, either liquid or solid. And so this vapor escapes. It's forced to escape by this. And on a regular solid, on this table, it would escape in an isotropic way, but here, the flow of vapor might be rectified. And then the question is, in which direction is it rectified, which is, I think, not obvious. 
And the answer is given by an experiment. If you place some traces, some little particles, you see that uh, the flow is indeed rectified uh, in the same direction as, as the body which is above. And so this tells you that the picture is the following one, seems to be the following one. There is still a lot of debate on that. Uh, it's a, quite an exciting experiment. This is a light linker experiment. Uh, the body which is above seems to be driven by the viscosity of the air which is below. It's a tiny force, but it's a tiny friction. And so it's a really a different world for uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, I would like to conclude with two illustrations of that. Uh, the first one is to try to have this phenomenon at a lower temperature. And for that, you mix the ratchet with super hydrophobic texture. And so you start at a large temperature, and it goes this way. And then you reduce the temperature. And because you place a hydrophobic texture, you can reduce a lot of temperature uh, close to the boiling point of water. It works similarly. And even below the boiling point of water, and this is nice because now there is no levitation, and you organize this race, and all the drops are self-propelling. This one looks very slow, but it's two centimeters per second in reality, despite the fact that we are below the boiling point. And so now we can propel at a low temperature such objects. The second and concluding remark is the fact that if what I said is correct, any flow of vapor which is directional should drive the body which is above in the same direction. In the ratchet, it's not obvious. It's not obvious that you rectify the flow, and it's not obvious in which direction you rectify the flow. So you can think of a solid where rectification is much more obvious, an experiment that was done recently by a very good student, Dan Soto, where you make, you etch grooves with this herringbone pattern, like this. You make it hot, so the liquid there evaporates. It presses on the film, and the film is forced to flow along the channels. And so now you choose the direction. And when you choose this direction, you indeed choose the direction of the drop which is, which is above. And so this is a kind of proof of what I said earlier. But with this system, you can go, of course, further, because the source of asymmetry is very clear. It is the angle of your pattern. And so you can vary this angle and look at the maximum force and look at the maximum velocity. And you have different answers, which are quite interesting. And then you can play with these elements. For example, you can place them head to tail, in which case, as you can guess, you will propel the liquid and then trap it, because the two elements are opposed, and there is some friction, so that at the end you realize something which is a kind of modern equivalent of the spoon in which Leiden Frost did its experiment. This is a flat spoon. What you can also do is to put herringbones in series and, 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 and uh, uh, hope, this is a top view, that inertia will be large enough to allow the liquid to come back to the next element so that instead of generating a race on something which is a few centimeters, you might reach uh, tens of centimeters and why not meters. And in this, in this top view, you realize that this is something which is indeed feasible and that you organize such long race that you become sensitive to the evaporation of the liquid. As you can see, as time is going on, this liquid is smaller and smaller. This is not perpetual motion. There is a source of energy. There is a fuel in this experiment, which is the drop itself. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Take a few questions. Yes, so, thank you for this beautiful talk. If there are some questions, you will be happy to answer. Any questions? Um, is it possible to predict the distribution of the size of the drops in the rain from the fragmentation? So I'm not a specialist of fragmentation, but uh, a colleague of mine, Emmanuel Villermo in Marseille, 
uh, wrote a nice review article on this question in the annual, annual review of fluid mechanics. And uh, of course, uh, meteorologists look at the distribution of size. It's a very important parameter they have. And uh, for my colleague and for other, other ones, it's a sign of what happened above. And uh, Villermo uh, belongs to the, to the scientists who uh, think that they can deduce from the distribution the fact that events such as the bag shape instability I showed indeed happen in the, in, uh, in the course of the, of the, of the fall of, 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 of the rain. So it's a, it, it, it might be a way to make a history. There are many mysteries there, including one which is uh, extremely important, which is the fact that in a cloud, the typical size of the droplets is 10 micrometers. And so if you think of the number of droplets you have to make, even to make one millimeter of drop, it's one million. It's 10 to the 2 to the 3. And so it's one million. How, what is the mechanism for coalescing so many drops to make uh, a big one? So the beginning of the story is not known, and what's happening in the fall is not really known. But it's exactly along your line. You can try to deduce uh, something from the distribution of the rate. This is a naive uh, question, but uh, what happens if you use heavy water? Heavy water in these experiments? Uh, please tell me the boiling point of heavy water. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, if you think of these experiments, the key point is, and it's a, very, it's a very interesting general question, the key point is to know when you induce levitation. Uh, and uh, what is known, it is, let's say, far above the boiling point of the liquid. By far above, I mean for water, boiling point is 100 degree. Uh, uh, levitation is typically above 200, 250 degrees, so far above. And so people try to understand this so-called Leiden frost temperature. Can we calculate it? Can we predict it? Uh, can we modify it? Uh, and, and there is today no answer to this question. It's a very elementary question, uh, indeed. Your question is naive, but uh, it's a difficult one. My guess, the, 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 the line we try to follow today, is to say that what matters is the thickness of the film that you make. Uh, because uh, you have this film which is very typically 50 micrometers. And of course, this film is thicker if temperature is larger. Okay, so there is... Uh, uh, function between the thickness of the film and the temperature of the plate. And I think that this film has to be thick enough. And so for me, it's a critical thickness rather than a criti criti critical temperature. And the reason is that you have the flow of vapor, and this flow of vapor induces waves at the surface of the bottom of the drop. And as a consequence, if the amplitude of the wave becomes comparable to the, to the height, to the thickness of the film, then you touch the substrate and you create nucleation and boiling. And so I think that uh, a possible candidate for understanding the condition of levitation is to, to look at these instabilities of the film uh, below the drop. So thank you for exciting presentation. I have some curiosities. Did you uh, measured any difference if, for example, in dynamics, you modulate the dew point or you modulate, you change the concentration disrupting the hydrogen bonding structure within these drops, how change the dynamics of the system, for example, in the drops flowing on the surface, high temperature, is any change if you make some mixture with methanol, ethanol, or if you change the external dew point? Yeah, so your question seems to contain uh, at least 10 questions. So I, I'll try to, to select uh, the ones I, I can answer. Uh, what I would say is first, it's something that I did not say, is the fact that the temperature of the liquid uh, sets at the boiling temperature. So we know the, the liquid temperature in these systems. It is the boiling point of the liquid, so for water, 100 degrees. So we know the properties of, 
of water uh, at 100 degrees, so we know what is this object. Then the question of the mixture, uh, can we make a mixture, can we add, I don't know, surfactants, for example, uh, uh, can, we, can we have a, a mixture between, uh, or differential evaporation? Uh, this is very poorly studied. Uh, what does not really work is when you try to make all of that a bit viscous, let's say, uh, then uh, it's terrible. Uh, there is immediately a very bad smell in the lab. Uh, if you add sugar, for example, you make very quickly caramel and so on. But uh, if you add surfactants, you make a big foam very quickly because there is a source of vapor which is there. Uh, but it's a very interesting question to, to use mixtures and to try to use these mixtures to induce uh, interesting properties, in particular by using differential uh, evaporation, obviously. But it's, I would say that uh, complex Leiden frost phenomena is uh, nearly a virgin uh, uh, area. I have a question. You showed that uh, when a drop uh, rolls, yeah. On the surface, you have these two shapes, yeah. two drops together, or one donut. So this is the frequency of how many times you have one case and the other is experimentally accessible. Yeah. Or so uh, yeah, it's it's something indeed that I did not say. So you do twice the same experiment, and you, I said, you find different things, but of course, uh, then there is a question of uh, what is the ratio. It's a, it's a very interesting question because. Uh, uh, you remember the story, Poincaré, Chandra Sekar, they, they, they deduce that you should observe peanuts, and what you observe the most is actually donuts. And I think the reason is that in this experiment, we are not in the sky. We are above a substrate, and so this substrate influences the transformation of the drop, uh, first, because it induces rotation, so this is a very nice thing, of course, to see these kind of shapes. But of, co of course, you also increase the velocity from zero to some final velocity, which is, in this experiment, typically a few meters per second. And so you explore gradually the phase diagram of centrifugation, and so you have this gentle uh, uh, sequence, which is not at all what they calculated. They start from a drop, which immediately is at the final velocity. And so this is why you follow the route, which uh, first make the, the earth with squeeze pole and then the disc and then the hole at the center. Uh, this is a natural route that you can, that you can follow. So uh, we are still interested in this kind of thing and uh, recently we uh, succeeded, I would be happy to show that in a, in a talk like this, Anaïs Gauthier, a very brilliant PhD student we have at the moment, with a slightly different way, succeeded in making uh, shapes which have not two lobes, but three lobes. This is something which is also a solution in the equation. It's very difficult to catch, but you can catch it. And this is your question. How do you catch the shape? Well, you catch the shape in the following way. In this experiment, you follow the route defined by Laplace uh, relay, so you find the wheel. But if you have any little obstacle on the plate, then it jumps a little bit, and then immediately, Chandra Sekar instability takes place, as you saw. And so the reason why you see peanuts is the fact that there is a little defect on your solid. If not, it stays more or less there uh, until the wheel becomes quite large. And then there is something very funny which happens. The wheel is quite large, so gravity squeezes, squeezes this wheel a little bit, and so it becomes elliptic. And so if you take an elliptic circle and you throw it on the ground, you'll see that it will self-jump. So the fate is always to decay in peanuts. 